2008 was truly a great year for video games, thanks in part to the release of Bethesda Games' Fallout 3. Rather than take what was the core foundation that made the first two Fallout games successful, Bethesda Games, after buying the franchise's license, created the series' next number installment from scratch. The end result was a critical and financial success that made part-time and simply intrigued Fallout players alike into true fans. Obsidian Entertainment was able to get involved in the 7th generation Fallout experience by releasing a successor to Fallout 3, titled Fallout New Vegas, that had no direct ties to the previous game but utilized a modified version of the same engine while taking players into the vast Mojave wasteland. Like Fallout 3, New Vegas garnered much acclaim from players and critics alike and became another hit. So it surprised no one that Fallout 4 was in development, but what did surprise many was the quick turnaround from the announcement of Fallout 4's existence and when it was released some five months later. After becoming a fan of the series thanks to copious amounts of hours spent playing the first three numbered Fallout games in New Vegas, I was nothing short of hyped for what promised to be another epic experience in an apocalyptic wasteland. Similar to many open world role playing games, Fallout 4 gives one the sense of freedom to explore and dictate what he or she wants to accomplish. But the point of every RPG is the story, which in this game's case kicks off with a prologue of sorts, as the player is allowed to create both a man and female character, husband and wife, to unknowingly send one into the commonwealth after the bombs drop and destroy almost everything. It's through the game's main story that the player is given a chance to explore the vast wasteland that was once the thriving city of Boston and beyond, with the goal of finding a child stolen from the embrace of his mother or father depending on which gender you decide to play as. For those experienced with the previous two Fallout games, Fallout 4 is close to familiar territory as you can get though there are noticeable gameplay modifications that change the way one will play. I mostly stuck to what helped me get through the wasteland in Mojave in Fallout 3 in New Vegas. Building up my character's endurance, health, money, medicine to heal my wounds and rid myself of radiation poisoning, and most importantly, heavy artillery. The hours spent with Fallout 4 reached the triple digits as they did when playing the previous iterations, ending in me not only seeing the endings available, but also me witnessing what would happen by siding with every faction available before that rare, at the time, Platinum Trophy popped on my screen. Fallout 4 had the initial promise of being everything the 7th generation Fallout games were, but better. Jumping into Fallout 4 was incredibly easy as the initial hour focused on crafting your character's body and specialities, before sending him or her on their merry bloody way. It's after the first major story point of the game that the players are given the chance to witness some of the tweaks to the standard Fallout gameplay that made 3 and New Vegas what they were. After acquiring the Pip-Boy computerized wristwatch, the player can utilize the vault Tech Assisted Targeting System or VATS in combat. Unlike the last two Fallouts, VATS doesn't stop time completely but only slows it down so the player can hit a specific region on an enemy. The higher percentage, the more likely the attack will land and do significant damage to the point of crippling an enemy, creating bullet time effects with each successful and unsuccessful hit. With enemies now moving during VATS, combat doesn't feel like a surety, and the player can actually be hit while in VATS, which wasn't a factor in the previous games. Also changed when it comes to VATS is the usage of critical hits. Once completely random, critical hits can now be triggered in the heat of combat. After killing enough people, a bar located at the bottom of the screen fills up until it's ready for use by the player with the tap of a button. Combat outside of VATS has too been modified for the better, actually feeling like a competent first person shooter rather than some clumsy attempt at copying Unreal Tournament. The game's guns and melee weapons have obvious weight and recoil to them and the cover system that functions easily and effectively by simply placing a character against or behind any wall with a weapon unholstered makes gunplay a much better experience compared to the previous Fallout games. Another change when it comes to the gameplay is how one customizes a character to journey through the commonwealth. First is the game skill tree, special, 
The game is seven traits for every character. Strength, perception, endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck. After gaining enough experience points from completing various tasks such as missions, killing enemies, and even picking locks, the character levels up while the player is given a point to distribute among these seven skill branches to attain certain attributes that can make for a character that you feel best suits your needs. The skill tree might feel a little dumbed down compared to its predecessors, but it works incredibly well if you plan ahead and decide how you want to play the game early on. Enemy AI has been changed to reflect more of what you would have expected years ago, but was obviously hampered by hardware limitations. Mole rats and rad scorpions now barrel underground before popping out to attack. Super mutants and raiders go out of their way to support fellow fighters and hastily pick up fallen weapons if said item is superior to the one that they're using. The more humanized enemies will use health items when need be, just like their playable adversary. And death claws are still the most fearsome things to face with or without power armor. There are also legendary enemies that have the ability to mutate and restore their health for another round. These latter enemies will drop legendary weapons that are typically better or modified versions of other items the player will most likely come across. Thanks to the enemies seen throughout the game, Fallout 4 delivers quite the challenge even when your character starts reaching higher levels. One major difference from Fallout 3 and New Vegas is the lack of weapon and armor degradation. In older games, weapons and armor would decay over time thanks to usage and combat. This is no longer the case as a player can use the vault suit that they attain at the beginning of the game throughout if someone wants to. One of the main reasons for this change is the ability to customize weapons and armor like never before. Almost every piece of loot has a purpose in Fallout 4 including turning run-of-the-mill items like aluminum cans into modification pieces that can make a certain weapon or armor into something you want to keep in your inventory for a long time. Power armor has also been modified in the way players can use the metal monstrosity. Instead of simply being able to put on the power armor and do as one pleases, the special covering is actually powered by fusion cores that need to be replaced once they run dry, an automatic action performed by the game. Though this change does take away some of the fun using power armor whenever you want, it does add a nice bit of strategy and potential challenge for those who didn't hunt every nook and cranny for that stray fusion core. Also power armor actually does degrade over time, so it must be repaired via special workstations. Companions also make a return in Fallout 4. There are 13 potential seconds that can accompany the player in his or her quest. Get to know a companion better or do things that he or she likes, and even more quests can open up that can change the way the companion reacts to the player and the world. Sadly, companions can be pretty stupid at times, chasing an invisible enemy and even running off for no apparent reason. For some odd reason, the player can't see how much a companion can carry unlike in New Vegas, causing inventory switching to be annoying at times. One of the most emphatic changes of the Fallout franchise comes with Forza's dialogue system. For the first time, the Vault Dweller, Lone Wanderer, Soul Survivor is able to speak instead of being a muted speech bubble that voices his or her opinions and decisions. The initial worry that a voice-acted protagonist would take away from the immersion of Fallout was hastily dashed by the performances of Brian Delaney and Courtney Taylor. But the voice-acting greatness comes at a price. In this case, it's the addition of the dialogue wheel, where the player is given only four options to choose from when asking or responding to questions. The end results most of the time feel stoic and generic due to the predetermined answers that will be given usually if you pick one of two responses that are noticeably similar in nature. While the dialogue options do speed up unnecessary conversations, it feels more limiting than it should for a game that embraces choice and exploration, be it through a half-destroyed building or by simply talking to non-controllable characters. Completely gone is the karma system seen in previous Fallout games. One of the most interesting aspects of 3 in New Vegas was the ability to see how your character's actions affected the world, and the response he or she got from the people who witnessed or simply heard of your character's escapades. Depending on what the player did or didn't do, reflecting on how others treated the character. The sense of morality that came with the Fallout games is no longer visible outside of the main storyline, and even then it feels more muddy than black and white. What isn't lacking or disappointing is the Commonwealth itself. With unusual blue skies overhead, tattered buildings to the point of obliteration, rusted cars and a variety of containers littering the streets, the world feels denser than 3 and Fallout New Vegas combined. 
The feeling intensifies as one moves from the initial holdings of Vault 111 into this New England area ravaged by atomic bombs that grew more dangerous thanks to super mutants, radioactive creatures, and homicidal humans alike. There are underground transit systems just waiting to be explored and cleared of ghouls both feral and radioactive. Interval buildings can house anything from raiders hoping to ambush unsuspecting individuals to random loot. While there are times building interiors will look alike, those moments come few and far between. My early time with Fallout 4 featured my character exploring the world before him to my benefit and, in more times than I like to admit, my detriment. The Commonwealth's vast majority is grand and everything one could have hoped for coming into a new Fallout game. One of the main reasons for exploring is meeting new people and potentially gaining new quests that flesh out the world and make it for a grander experience. While there are times these extra missions feel unnecessarily repetitive and long-winded, the want to see what could happen if you go about doing something differently, to witness what comes of it convinces the player to keep trying. And then there are the standalone side quests that feel just as impressive and fun as the main story missions. Sadly, one of the biggest faults with Fallout 4 is the main story. What starts off as a revenge tale slowly descends into absurdity as the player is forced to choose between a siding with a faction over the Commonwealth's fate and immediate future. Midway through the story, it becomes obvious why Bethesda introduced so many things to keep a player busy. The story is incredibly short and lacking a certain edge one would expect from the franchise. The big reveals and decisions aren't as profound as one would hope, and results in a sense of apathy during the final missions depending on what faction you sided with in this battle to the death that for some odd reason can't be avoided, even though the game doesn't feature an obvious antagonist or puppet master as seen in the last two Fallout games, that gave the player a great satisfaction in killing. Then there are the conclusions that are barely endings at all, but just obvious open-ended rhetoric to potentially set up future downloadable content. While the endings to Fallout 3 and New Vegas weren't masterful, they at least felt like true conclusions to a journey while attempting to evoke an emotional response from the player. Fallout 4 doesn't have that quality sense of finality. Last but certainly not least is the addition of settlements. Players are given the opportunity to not only live alongside NPCs, but also build upon the areas they currently occupy. Junk items like the aforementioned aluminum cans become essential resources in crafting shelter, farmland, and defense systems, and even electrical towers, actually giving everything you loot a reason to exist other than being excess weight for cheap sales. Settlement building can become a game within a game for the highly skilled, creative, and most importantly, patient. While building a settlement can be intriguing at first, the lack of information and a true tutorial makes the experience daunting initially. The task of constructing is made even worse by the tools provided. For some reason, the game actually has the character move around while he or she is building, causing frustrating problems when a character has, say, gotten stuck inside of a room with no exit. Depending on what area you're working with, pieces might not fit or come together as planned. There are also the happiness and size meters that change depending on how satisfied the residents are by having enough food, water, beds, and defense and how much stuff is in your settlement before you can't build any more respectively. The hope of getting 100 on the happiness meter can be glitchy at times, and the size limiting just feels unnecessary. And you can't have a Bethesda game without the abundant amount of glitches. While Fallout 4 doesn't suffer from the same problems seen in Fallout 3 post-launch, the game still features a staggering number of instances that can hinder one's good time. I, like many others, suffered from that settlement happiness meter glitch that saw my original settlement become disgruntled for no reason. While there weren't many terrible glitch experiences in my playthrough, others haven't had the same benefit. There are other performance issues including jerky animations, lip syncing being off, sounds dropping in and out, frame rate drops that can trick you into believing the game has completely frozen for a second or two. Fallout 4, in a lot of ways, is exactly the experience one should expect from a Bethesda-headed game, featuring suitable innovation and a wow factor that made Fallout 3 so impressive, yet being terribly unpolished and not optimized due to the limitations of an outdated engine. But what about those who have my mindset when Fallout 3 came out and don't know what to do? While Fallout 4 truly lacks a memorable story, has quirks both big and small, and features an entire minigame that can add hours of creative enjoyment or none at all, 
Fallout 4 still feels like an exceptional experience that, while not the game changer Fallout 3 was, is worth trying for a few hours. If you can get over the difficulty hurdle that is the norm for every Fallout, and still want to play more, you'll probably enjoy what Fallout 4 mostly offers. But that doesn't take away the feeling that as enjoyable and addictive the game can be, Fallout 4 is inconsistent in its quest for greatness, be it because of the story or the core gameplay's functionality. Falling short and attaining unadulterated success where it shouldn't have considering the competition both in the franchise and beyond. What's with the fancy guns? What's expensive? What be I found a new stand? Today's episode in the parlor of mysteries. Your crimes have gone unpunished for too long. What the hell's wrong with you? Chamomile. Well, nothing a few bullets won't cure. Well, that scumbag slug, but you're sick with fever.